NEPM's podcasts are funded by Armbrook Village, offering research-based arts, music, fitness, and lifelong learning programs at their assisted living and Alzheimer's care community in Westfield, armbrookvillage.com. The fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, homegrown in Hatfield, Massachusetts, and providing energy savings for their customers for over 10 years. Learn more at northeast-solar.com. Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Cooley Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte, and we are on the road once again at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art in North Adams, where, for 23 of their 25 years, the Bang on a Can Summer Music Festival has transformed Mass Mocha into a genre-bending musical home for innovative composers and performers. What happened in those other two years? Oh, maybe they just didn't have Bang on a Can here yet in those early years. You know, you got to get, get a build up some momentum. <laughs> Over three weeks, every nook and cranny of the campus comes alive with performances, workshops, and seminars focused on adventurous new music, culminating in Loud Weekend, a fully loaded three-day eclectic supermix of creative, experimental, and unusual music with renowned special guests, Bang on a Can faculty, and young players take the Hunter Center stage in a collision of jazz, classical, rock, and beyond. Bang on a Can's Loud Weekend at Mass Mocha is this weekend. August 1st through 3rd. Later in the show, we'll talk with Bang on a Can founders Julia Wolf and Michael Gordon. But let's start with some music. Joining us is Bang on a Can all star Vicky Chow. Pianist Vicky Chow has been described as brilliant by the New York Times and one of our era's most brilliant pianists by Pitchfork since joining the Bang on a Can all stars in 2009. She has collaborated and worked with composers, artists, ensembles, orchestras such as Tanya Leone, Meredith Monk, Steve Reich, Philip Glass, Bill T. Jones, and Arnie Zane Dance Company, the BBC Orchestra, the LA Philharmonic, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, the Kronos Quartet, and and so many more. She's toured over 40 countries and performed in so many of the renowned concert halls, from Carnegie to the Royal Albert. She's released over 25 solo and chamber albums on various labels. Originally from Vancouver, she's based now in Brooklyn and serves as faculty at the Bang on a Can Summer Institute, where we kind of are right now. She's also a mentor at the Juilliard School from which she graduated. Playing a piece by the multidisciplinary artist Meredith Monk, we welcome to the fabulous 413, Vicky Chow. Chow playing for us live in one of, I think we're in building six of Mass Mocha. I can overlook the Rodin Crater exhibit here in the museum. The museum is closed on Tuesdays. That's why there isn't, aren't throngs of people here cheering for you, Vicky, except for the, the two of us and, and our uh, engineers. We can count as a throng. Yeah, we can count <laughs> as a throng. And that was a beautiful piece by Meredith Monk. Yeah. Oh, Vicky's going back to the piano. Oh. 
<laughs> I thought there was going to be an encore for a no, second there. Don't leave your music. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Tell us what, um, what drew you to that piece. Um, well, th that piece that I just played is called Railroad Travel Song. And it was written by Meredith Monk in 1981. Um, you know, Meredith uh, obviously is very well known for her, her vocal style. Her, um, and also she plays a lot of piano, you know, and um, she wrote a, a, a series of uh, short piano pieces um, that I'll be performing here at Loud Weekend. Um, so I, had, I, I chose like four solo piano pieces and this was one of them. Um, I love that it's a railroad theme piece because if anyone's been to a concert here at Mass Mocha, especially in Joe's Field out there, the train comes through frequently <laughs> in the middle of the performances. So it just ties in so nicely to everything that Mass Mocha's got going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, it, and it really does sound like going over, over tracks, um, it, which I always feel is cool. It just m lends to atmosphere. Um, Meredith Monk is here for, for this particular weekend working on pieces with, with um, the fellows and, and the ensemble. Has she gotten to work with, have you gotten to work with her one-on-one -on -one with the pieces that you're doing of hers? Um, well, the Bang on a Can All Stars has a, 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 a project with Meredith and the Meredith Monk Vocal Ensemble, um, and we'll be performing that uh, on uh, Saturday, closing out the festival. It's called Memory Games. Um, and, you know, we released an album on Cantaloupe, and it's really wonderful. It's revisiting a lot of her um, older works um, and uh, new arrangements of these earlier works of hers. Um, I think one of, uh, a lot of them is from her earlier opera, The Games. Mm. We're speaking with Vicki Chow, who just played this wonderful piano piece by Meredith Monk for us here, in anticipation of the loud weekend, Bang on a Can's takeover of Mass Mocha here in North Adams. And you mentioned Meredith Monk is going to be here, you'll be working with her, and that you've uh, worked with Philip Glass in the past, performed some of Philip Glass's pieces in front of Philip Glass. People like to think of this as new music, quote unquote, some sort of alternative to classical music. We haven't found a good word to describe what this kind it of music is. It still feels ridiculous to call an entire genre of music by one era in that, music, <laughs> in that genre of music. But you're not going to be able to perform a Beethoven piece in front of Beethoven if that was the avenue of this type of music that you decided to go through. What's it like to be able to perform a piece by a living composer of such renown like Meredith Monk, like Philip Glass? Well, the wonderful thing is that you can actually get their feedback, you know, um, get to hear their thoughts about your interpretation. You can ask them questions about the score, you know, any questions about interpretation, you know, they will be able to answer you. And of course, just, it's just a, a very special thing to be able to meet the creator of the work that you're performing. How does this year's um, festival feel different from last year's festival. Last year when we got a chance to, to meet you, you were accompanying a cellist and um, a part of this really interesting, very percussive trio um, that we got to hear. But this year we're getting to hear you solo. Like what's different between last year and this year in terms of like just scope? Um, well, there's also uh, there's always a very wide ranging um, uh, program of music from from all sorts of composers. Um, I think there's uh, some new collaborations happening. Um, I know the Bang and Can All Stars is performing with Shabaka, which is very exciting. I think we're going to eavesdrop on a rehearsal of that. That's the plan. And I'm excited about that yeah, too because so I got to really see him cool. at Big Ears doing some of some of his newer stuff, and that was fascinating. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. And that is like literally happening like right now. We just started rehearsing with him yesterday and we're rehearsing the next few days and we're premiering the new work on Thursday. So it's really fresh, fresh ink, fresh collaborations. <laughs> we mentioned in your introduction that you, Vicky Chow, are a mentor at Juilliard where you graduated from. We're really lucky to know some folks um, in the eastern part of Western Mass in Franklin County at Antenna Cloud Farm in Gill, where a lot of these Juilliard-trained musicians have come and are in some ways breaking away from the traditions that you think of when you think of the music of Juilliard, when you think of quote-unquote classical music. Are, are you still doing more traditional stuff as a mentor at Juilliard? And are you seeing more and more people coming through that tradition and wanting to branch out into these newer forms of contemporary quote-unquote new music? I think over the years I've seen more interest from um, students 
studying at conservatories like Juilliard um, in, in exploring new sounds and new ways to play their instrument. Uh, I think new music and contemporary music has kind of broken into like the, the, the general public and the general uh, uh, sphere of uh, music makers. Um, like, you know, you have like the Metropolitan Opera producing like new operas now, like that's like a really big thing. Yeah, um, yeah like I think it's a, there's a very bright future. I mean, you can see it by uh, coming here to the Bang and Can Summer Festival and, and witnessing the next generation, like the young fellows from around the world performing the, the, the pieces of young comp uh, composers from all over the world. Um, you can witness it here. Like they're doing it, they're interested and they all come from conservatories. They all have classical backgrounds. Um, they have a foundation in that, but they want to explore something that is uh, contemporary and relevant to today. Was there something that awakened you? Did you start in the more uh, classical tradition and then uh, something awakened in you that made you go off in a different direction? And if so, what was that? Oh, um, yeah, so I definitely was very classical, uh, in the, rooted in the classical tradition. You know, growing up, I performed with orchestras. And I thought I was going to be performing with orchestra when I grew up and or doing solo recitals, the very traditional path. But once I got to Juilliard, I think something in me... Um, uh, I realized, um, you know, everyone there, all the pianists were all in our practice rooms practicing the same Beethoven sonata. And it didn't make any sense to me, like, why are we all, we were all working on the same music. Uh, the canon seems so limited. And um, it's like, well, what ha what's happening now, you know? And I had the fortune of um, working with and meeting composer Joe Tien. Uh, he teaches in Michigan now. Um, and I think like one of his albums got like a Grammy nomination. Um, so he's, you know, uh, having a successful career. But we were in school together. And one day we were in, um, he ran into the elevator where I was in and asked me if I could play in his concert in the following week because his pianist dropped out. Up until that point, I've never really done a lot of new music, but I wanted to help a friend out. And when I opened up the score, I realized, wow, there's this whole other universe out there. There's new notation and sounds that I've never heard you know, being made. Um, and that's what sparked my interest in working with living composers. There's a lot of different directions that contemporary classical, <laughs> I, it's just, I hate. You should always say it with slight disdain. It's just, it, it is an inappropriate phrase and we haven't come <laughs> up with something better. Um, because like there are a lot of different avenues that it takes. There are things that are a little more jazz influenced. There are things that take like more of the the repetitive minimalist approach of like Philip Glass. Um, there are things that I think are more romantic based, like Meredith Monk's work, is, which is how I see her work. Like, are there things in modern music that draw your ear and your attention and your fingers to the keyboard more? Yeah, I think what the really great thing and fun thing to do with new music is that um, now um, the, the style, like you said, as you described, it, it borrows from so many different genres. There's so many different styles. You know, when you look back in time, like, you know, the Baroque sounded like Baroque. It was one style, the, you know, classical, romantic. It was impressionistic. You know, they all writ, wrote in a particular way and they all, all the music from that period all sounded the same. But here, you know, it really reflects our time. Like we have internet, we can listen to music from all over the world. We have access to all these sounds. So composers are also composing like that composing music that sounds like all these different things that they've heard. You know, that, that's another thing, you know, that the, the, the um, composers back then couldn't hear sounds from different cultures or different musical instruments. They were very limited, but now you can hear everything. And so um, as a, a, a person that's, that's, you know, dedicated to, to doing this, I have the ability to pick and choose exactly which styles I want to explore. Like, I love doing things with electronics, um, so I can do that. I, I love, like, you know, um, more minimal or more tonal music, and I can do that. But if there's someone that wants to do more, um, like, modern or, you know, thorny music, they, have, they can do that. Like, it's, it's all over. And, you know, what's really great also now is that you have a lot of, like, kind of cross... Um, disciplinary and, and also cross-cultural kind of collaborations where you have different instruments performing together, you know, like just kind of like the Silk Road Ensemble, you mm -hmm. know, um, that's a perfect example. And, and I think that's really, really wonderful. Well, the person we were referencing before um, from Antenna Cloud Farm is part of the Silk Road Ensemble. And one thing that was eye-opening to me, and her husband is also a, a well-decorated and brilliant musician, 
improvisation, not necessarily their, their forte, to use a musical term. Um, how much does improvisation play into Bang on a Can? And how comfortable do you feel in the world of improvisation? Because you mentioned there was new notation when you were working with that first composer, like something kind of brand new to somebody who could probably sight read virtually anything we put in front of you. Yeah, with the uh, you know with the Bang on a Can All Stars, like it's really great. It's, it's a sextet. There's six of us. Um, so I play keyboard and pianos. There is clarinet and saxophones. There is cello, double bass or electric bass, um, guitar, all sorts. You know, electric and or acoustic. Um, and there's also percussion and drum set. You know, so you have kind of like a hybrid um, rock, jazz, classical group. You know, and the backgrounds of everyone um, really come from different, you know, places like Mark Stewart, who is the original founder of Bang & Can All-Stars, and the, the guitarist, um, you know, uh, his day job is, you know, playing with Paul Simon. You know, he was his, you know, you know, side man, you know, like musical director for many, many, many years. I saw him topless outside in one of the <laughs> courtyards playing with giant hoses that he's going to make all of the uh, fellows come play with to make sounds from. We saw him doing that last year, too. Yeah, he's also an instrument maker. That's what yes. you saw. Um, <laughs> and uh, you have, you know, um, and, and he has a classical background. He studied cello in, back in the day. Um, and then you have Ken Thompson on saxophone and clarinet, and he has a jazz background, and he's a wonderful composer as well. Um, you know, and then you have, you know, someone like me that, you know, studied at Juilliard, like very classical classically trained, but I've also now ventured into like stuff with electronics, um, you know, a little bit of free improv, you know, I don't have a jazz background, um, but you have, you know, everyone bringing in different skills and different experiences into the group when we're performing. Vicky Chow, thank you so much for performing for us today. We're really excited about you and the All-Stars performing once again for the Loud Music Weekend, which is here at Mass Mocha this weekend, August 1st through 3rd. It was even nice when we were just setting up our gear, getting to uh, plug in cables and, and you know, set and here up you warm up <laughs> while you were warming up. So it was a wonderful way to, to begin our day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. On the way, we've got four-time Grammy Award-winning cellist and Bang on a Can faculty member, Nick Fotinos. And we'll meet Bang on a Can founders, Julia Wolf and Michael Gordon. Live from Mass Mocha and North Adams, you're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by the UMass Five College Credit Union, offering co-op advantage checking with cash back on all purchases, plus secure debit card controls, all from the UMass Five mobile banking app. Insured by NCUA, umass5.coop. NEPM's podcasts are funded by Armbrook Village Senior Living in Westfield, offering assisted living and compass memory support with evidence-based treatment for those with memory loss. More at armbrookvillage.com. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. We are at Mass Mocha, where Bang on a Can has once again taken over this muse Museum of Contemporary Art. The Bang on a Can Loud Weekend is this weekend. And joining us is Bang on a Can faculty member and four-time Grammy Award-winning cellist Nick Fotinos. He is an innovative and multifaceted cellist and ardent advocate of new music. And he has worked closely with many of the foremost composers of this era and premiered hundreds of works throughout his career. Nick Fotinos has collaborated and toured with an incredible array of artists, including rock and pop artists like Bjork, Wilco, never heard of them here at Mass Mocha, and Bonnie Prince Billy, jazz artists like Sheila Jordan and Matt Ullery, and classical artists like Philip Glass, and of course, the Bang on a Can All-Stars, which is why we are here. Joining us from Mass Mocha to perform something from the Brazilian composer Marcos Balter. Is that still correct, Nick? All right, take it away, Nick Fotinos.
is performing live here at Mass Smoka in Building 6 as we gear up for the Loud Music Weekend. Holy uh, harmonics, Batman. I know. I can't believe <laughs> the sounds were coming out of that. I only hope that the microphone was picking them up in the kind of way. We're getting a thumbs up from Bart Rankin, our engineer, in the kind of way that we were hearing them in this room. That was all cello, despite uh, what you might have thought you heard while driving around in your car listening to what was uh, going on through But speaking radio. of the improvised instruments outside, like it sounds a lot like that. And I don't know if it was intentionally meant to mimic that or, or rain or just like general harmonics, but like how cool <laughs> yeah, I, I, heard it yeah. whistling. I heard it as like a chorus of little bits of whistling and things like that. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah, I think all of that's great. And I think all of that, um, Marcos Balter, I feel like wants you to fill in the gaps mm -hmm. of what does this mean to you. Um, it's not about anything. I mean, it is in a sense, the piece is called Memoria, um, but, um, but really it's just kind of this slow unfolding and changing of timbres and of, and of um, this trilling kind of tremulous nature uh, that just is just this beautiful tapestry. It reminds so. me if you gave Sonic uh, like Sonic Youth's Thurston Moore a cello, that, <laughs> but with no yeah. amp, you're like, yeah, but like this way less, feedback way less feedback. Yes. His, his actual <laughs> instrument is feedback. He, he shows like up feedback. with a guitar, but his instrument is feedback. Yeah, but that sounded like feedback in some ways, <laughs> right? Too, yeah, in like the most brilliant way. Right. I think that's that's part of it too. Like he's really kind of exploring the extremes of the instrument, and I think that's true of a lot of the music he writes. Um, He's really interested in that kind of transformation of sound, but also exploring sounds that aren't necessarily associated with that instrument. So, you know, for if you, uh, I think it's a great compliment if someone heard that on the radio and were like, oh, I had no idea that was a cello at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, great, I did my job. <laughs> There's always room for cello. <laughs> There's always room for cello. Well, and, and like then, then it just kind of increases what the cello can do. The mm -hmm. cello can do that too. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm so curious what that score looks like. <laughs> you know, it looks surprised. I mean, there's there's some figuring out, but it actually looks, it's all in 4-4 four, four at mm -hmm. quarter note equals 60. Like, it's all, in a way, very simple on the page, but, like, the control of going between these timbres and techniques is the tricky part, mm. and doing it kind of seamlessly. Um, but it actually, on the like, for all the sounds that are created, um, it actually is relatively simple on the page, surprisingly, yeah. That's fascinating. Now, that was a, a piece by Marcos Walter. I know there's another piece being performed by Marcos Walter here as part of the Loud Weekend. Yes, and that, I think, um, I'm not in that piece, so uh -huh. I can't speak a ton about it, but I do know that um, it's inspired by um, a collaboration that he had back a number of years ago with the band Deerhoof. Right. Mm. And so um, I think it's funny because I was talking to um, Ken Thompson, uh, one of the people leading that group, and he asked Marcos, like, oh, so is this kind of a pop tune? It's like, you know, or like an arrangement. He's like, no, no, this is still part of me. It's just a different facet. So it really is part of his language. He's pretty omnivorous um, in, his, in, in what he brings uh, to his compositions. Also, I'd, I'm not sure I would describe Deerhoof's music as pop. But. Well, 
compared to what many of the other musicians are coming from, perhaps. Yeah, fair. Yeah. Or, yes. you know, a more more popular sphere, but what they're what they're making. Like I, I, weirdly enough, like when they put out the album Dear Maggie, one of the things you could get for merch was the score to the album, yeah. and their um, their instrumentation and the way that they approached it seemed very similar to to Baltus's a, a approach so that that matchup seems entirely natural and now I'm absolutely like looking forward to that. Yeah, I know that's going to be great. I've heard it's amazing. So I'm looking forward to it too. <laughs> and we're speaking with the four-time Grammy Award winner Bang on a Can member uh Nick Fotinos who played beautifully the Marcos Balter piece on cello for us here. Uh we were talking to Vicky Chow earlier about her trajectory into this world of so-called new music. What was your trajectory? Were you trained in the quote unquote classical manner and did you have an aha moment that put you off into a new direction? Sure. I mean, yeah, I was definitely, I went to conservatory and, and did that training. Um, I, you know, it happened pretty early, I got to say. Um, I had, um, when I was growing up in the Bay Area in California and I was in Oakland Youth Symphony and San Francisco Youth Symphony, especially in Oakland Youth Symphony, um, there was a conductor there that we did classics, but then we also did this um, Ollie Wilson piece called Lumina, and we did, and it was the first time playing Rite of Spring, and like mm -hmm. all these pieces that were like, I had no idea an orchestra or even, you know, instruments, my instrument could sound like that. And it really just kind of lit the fire even then. And even when I entered um, college, you know, I was... I, I still thought maybe, okay, I'm gonna be an orchestral cellist, but then like I always loved chamber music and I really loved new music and trying new things. And so um, the director of the New Music Ensemble, who's still there and I'm gonna see in October, uh, Tim Weiss, kind of put together a group. He was the conductor of the New Music Ensemble. And so he put together um, a small group of people to kind of rehearse stuff outside of the normal time, like harder pieces that kind of required a little more time. That eventually became Eighth Blackbird. Mm -hmm. And so I was a founding member of that group uh, from 96 uh, until my departure in 2020. So that, and so my, most of my career, um, and still a lot of my career is in new music, um, and I love it. How much do you have an opportunity to work with some of the younger people that are coming up through this weekend? Are you, are you working with uh, folks here at Mass Mocha in this world of new music? And have the students and their interests and abilities changed in the time that you've been doing stuff with Bang on a Can here? Um, that's a great question. I am definitely um, working um, a lot with uh, composers. Um, I'm conducting four of the new world premieres that happen here. But then I'm also, one thing that's happened um, over the years is we have them write really short pieces, like two minutes, three minutes each, here at the festival. Like we don't tell them what groups they're writing for. We kind of spring it on them. Like just write something fast. Just blah, blah, throw something on the page, just do it. And so I'm also involved in some of those as well. Um, and it's, it's a really great joy to work, um, to see what people are influenced by. And I think one of the things I've noticed over 17 years of teaching here is that I think the influences from everyone just get wider and wider and wider, which is fantastic. Um, I see that as a whole, even within the new music sphere of like, everybody's bringing everything to the table. And like, so it's not, you know, you can go to a new music concert and you can hear stuff influenced by country music and by gamelan and by everything, you know, and like some of these things have been going on for a while, but others like, you know, there's really no limits and nothing's, nothing's forbidden to reference. Like you can really just bring that in. And if you do it in an authentic and a new way and kind of create something new, then that becomes really exciting. I know that there's both um, composition and performance here, and both are fostered, but are you starting to see more bleed f in those two spheres where people do are doing more of both in, in contemporary music? I absolutely do, and actually that's a trend I see as well, is that um, most more and more composers also perform regularly, and more and more performers are also writing music, at least for themselves, if not for themselves and other people, or sometimes just other people. And so this festival has been a really great example of that, where it's a really, um, I was just talking to some of the fellows yesterday, and like, oh, it's like, oh, it's such a supportive, um, you know, three weeks here that everybody's trying to help each other and like make each make things happen for each other and so like increasingly over the years like we have these lunchtime recitals and you'll see more and more student compositions um like from the fellows themselves rather than them playing you know famous works there's some of that too but it's really exciting to see people start to begin to like oh i can do this too it's not something that's i'm just a performer and there's a composer over there 
sort of a thing. So, which is fascinating because I think if you look at the trajectory of popular music in in the United States in the 20th century, you had uh, you know Tin Pan Alley and the Brill Building writing all these songs for these performers, and then you get a Dylan or a Joni Mitchell or you know whomever that's now a singer songwriter. This is sort of happening. A, a little bit later, I guess, in the world of, let's call it orchestral music, for lack of a better word. Well, I would say it's a return. Yeah. Because, like, you know, like, back in the day, you know, box day, like, there wasn't really necessarily Bach a distinction. Bach in the day. Bach, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Too early for dad jokes. Thank you. Um, Never. No, Thank you. Um, yes. But in <laughs> in the Baroque period, or, you know, even in um, into the, quote-unquote, big C classical period, you know, the, the line between performer and composer was not as set. And so you had a lot more of that. And then it became, once kind of the rise of virtuosi happened on instruments, then there was more of a separation. But now it's kind of coming back. Yeah, you'd be and doing salons beautiful. of your, your work right. um, for exposure and possible patronage. Right. So, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting back to it. Which is very fascinating to me because I think the skill level of so many of these people are, are so incredible. So to see them be able to create works of their own and then bring their skill level to their instrument, to their own works, Absolutely. Is, a, is a wonderful thing. Tell us a little bit, Nick Fotinos, four-time Grammy Award winner, uh, a faculty member for Bang on a Can, about some of the, the new works that you're premiering here at Loud Weekend this weekend. Well, um, so besides the uh, new works uh, by the composers, um, I think that's, in terms of premiering works, that's the only thing I'm involved in. Though there's performances of Marcos Balter's piece that I just performed, as well as a very rarely heard work. I only could find two recordings from many, many years ago of a piece by Louis Andreessen called Symphony for Open Strings. And it's for 10 string players, but all of, the, all of them detune their strings in different ways. Mm. And so they only ever play open strings, but you get these melodies created, like it's fragmented and it's, it's really, really cool. It's like nothing else I've ever heard. Um, so that piece, and that was written in the 70s, and so it doesn't get performed very often. So that's definitely really exciting. Um, and then there's um, brand new pieces by the All Stars. I know um, they're doing a, a piece with uh, Shabaka, mm -hmm. and that's going to be. I've heard that's really amazing. Um, so there's lots of new music, um, and you know, even um, I just did a recital back this past Friday with uh, my good friend Ken Thompson, also fellow faculty member, of a piece that I commissioned from Pamela Z that was written this year that we premiered this year, and then also a piece of his that he just wrote that I played in amongst many other people that was also written this year. So definitely there's a lot that's happening from 2024, for sure, so. Does it feel like a family reunion every year when you come back together? It really does. Um, and we always joke, there's a bunch of us that live on this River Street house that like, you know, house is a little bit in shambles, but like we wouldn't move because of the hangs every night, <laughs> you know? So it's like, that's, that's what we come back to the festival for, so yeah. And the music and all of that, but the hangs are really great. Come on, that's what makes life worth living. Absolutely. Yeah. Similarly, does it feel like sending your kids off to college at the end of when you've after you've been working with these fellows for three weeks? Well, you know what's amazing? I've been at this festival now for 17 years, and you see people like now they're professionals, and now they're in, they're doing amazing things, and I'm and I'm working with some of them. Um, one great example is a clarinetist that was here a number of years ago, Andy Hudson, who now. I'm touring recently, you know, cello and clarinet pieces with. And so we're doing that all over. We did that in Romania last year and doing it in Cincinnati and Chicago this year. And so like, it's, um, it's really great to have the, to create those connections and then see where people go because it's always, there's always a lot of people doing really interesting stuff. Thanks so much for joining us here today, Nick. That was a beautiful, beautiful piece. It Thank you. blew my mind how many interesting sounds you could get with just your bow and that cello in this glorious big space in Building 6 at Madison. Like, our minds have been blown with harmonics and string instruments oh, totally. in the past couple of days, <laughs> yeah. uh, in the past couple of weeks. Like, yeah. It's just so, so cool. Thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank <laughs> you. Four-time Grammy Award winner and a faculty member here at Bang on the Can, Nick Fotinos. Thanks again. Up next, we'll meet Bang on a Can founders, Julia Wolf and Michael Gordon. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. NEPM's podcasts are funded by Armbrook Village Senior Living in Westfield, offering assisted living and compass memory support with evidence-based treatment for those with memory loss. More at armbrookvillage.com. And should we be careful with our... Nah, oh, that's yeah. okay. It'll just add I'll to just the drama of live radio. I love it. Right, right. <laughs> we have a great drumming group. This 
<laughs> but see, that's what bang on a can is all about. Yeah. These are iced, iced coffees coffee. that are being played as instruments. Oh, yeah. So yeah. bang on a can. Me ideas and the thing is, right it's now. not the first time Music I've seen water coffee. or or liquid being used as the percussion in something. <laughs> yeah, so true. that's true. Um, true. I wanted to ask Nick about playing with Bjork and if she made him dress as like a fawn or something. Yeah, a swan. Um, <laughs> because that's what was happening with her ensemble when I saw her, and it was so good, but also a little mind-blowing. And anyhow, welcome back to the fabulous 413. We are at Mass Mocha. I'm Kali Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte, and we are with two of the founders of this institute that has made uh, iced coffee a musical instrument now, <laughs> Bang on a Can, who will once again celebrate Loud Weekend this weekend here at Mass Mocha. The two founders that join us are Michael Gordon and Julie. Julia Wolf. Julia is a Pulitzer Prize winner and a MacArthur Fellow, so we may refer to you as genius occasionally. <laughs> and Michael's been honored by the Guggenheim and the National Endowment for the Arts, amongst many others. On a trip to New York, Julia became friends with composition students Michael Gordon and David Lang, both of whom had recently attended the Yale School of Music and who encouraged her to apply. She went to Yale in 1984, married Michael Gordon the same year. After receiving her Master of Music in 1986, Wolf, Gordon, and Lang founded the new music collective Bang on a Can in 1980. Bang on a Can is now an organization with a concert series and tours and a summer festival right here in the Northern Berkshires for emerging composers and performers. Bang on a Can will once again celebrate their loud weekend this weekend. Thank you both for joining us. Great to be here. Great Thanks. to be with you Thank guys. You. In the many years of Bang on a Can, have there been, how many compositions have actually been written for cans? For cans? Oh, well, we, we had someone sing into a can way back in the early years. Uh -huh. Do you remember that piece? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, Kay Ashley, but, his name. But we have to go back to a piece by John Cage um, mm. that um, called Three Constructions. The third construction, which we performed very early on in our history, has a whole setup of cans. Uh -huh. So really, it's the spirit of John Cage. And is that where the name indeed came from, or is it just the, uh, the whole notion of banging on a can? Well, you know, when we sat around and made our little list of names, there were some crazy names on that list. <laughs> uh, one of the things I think, we, I think, and that guy, I sort of accidentally said, well, you know, just we have to describe this concert. It was another concert pre banging on a can. So just say it's a bunch of composers banging on cans. I said something like that. So I didn't actually think of the name. But then it must have been Dave or something. Someone turned and said, that's it, banging on a can. I, it's something said off the cuff. We went with it, you know, partly to create something uh, inviting, ir irreverent, um, you know, to signal we're making a change. It's not like, you know, some kind of more official, bland name uh, <laughs> that we could have picked. So uh, it was controversial at the time. I remember we were like, can we fund something called <laughs> Bang on a Can? You know, it reached the boards of foundations or but you know, some of them were okay. Yeah. With it. So here we are. <laughs> here we are for the 23rd time out of 25 years of Mass Mocha. And we were talking earlier in the show about is it because it took Mass Mocha a couple of years to get up and running before Bang on a Can was here? Or then I thought, well, maybe it was the two years of COVID. So well, how come it's 23 of the 25 years? Uh, well, we, we actually had a beautiful concert over COVID. Uh, it, we didn't have the festival, but I just would mention because it, it was just this remarkable moment where. Mass Milk has this big garage door on a second level of one of the huge open spaces. So the garage door lifted up. The Bang and the Can All Stars were sitting up there on the second floor open air space. And the audience was in this kind of you know outdoor courtyard in their little square. So Mass Milk drew these squares. You could fit maybe two, three lawn chairs in them. <laughs> you brought your own chair, you sat distance yeah and it was just like oh my gosh we're hearing music again live <laughs> you know it was a very emotional performance for everybody so i don't know if that counts really as, as one of the years but i think um, they must be counting it then. maybe they're mm -hmm. counting it but it, but um i know david lang initially were, walked through these empty halls of the factory um, with joe thompson who was the founder and put on a hard hat and they were under construction and they just said do you think you could do something? You know, Joe turned to David and said, do you think you could bring music into this, these spaces? He's like, uh-huh, yes, yes, we can. Oh, man. <laughs> so, you know, early conversations, but of course it took a while to get them up and running, to the, the museum up and running. So, but very early in their history, we, we joined them. Now you're an institution at the institution. Forget about Wilco, they're Johnny Come Lately's. <laughs> <laughs> and they only come every other year. You guys come every year. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing new music every year. <laughs> We still love you, Jeff Tweedy. Yes. <laughs> we were um, last week 
at Tanglewood, and we were talking about the 150th anniversary of the birth of Kusevitsky, who the shed is named after, and who is arguably, and in most people's accounts, the founder of Tanglewood, this person who wanted to take these musicians out of their city and go to the country and perform together and learn together and instruct another generation. It's hard not to see the similarities between what you both, as two of the founders of Bang on a Can, have started here, and what Kusevitsky started at Tanglewood. So we've got like, you know, Tanglewood South and, and Bang on a Can North taking over the Berkshires, well, instructing people in these orchestral, for lack of a better word again, types of instruments. And the dedication to contemporary music too, because like he was a pioneer of, of working with modern in of the moment composers and you're doing exactly that too, fostering both composition and, and performance of modern in the moment of the now pieces. Who in that vein is coming that we really need to, I mean, we need to see all of them because they're fantastic, but we did just sit in a rehearsal with Shibaka, who I got to see at Big Ears and who's been doing amazing things just compositionally. Besides that and the Meredith Monk piece, who else is coming to the festival this year? Well, I just say we're super excited about Shibaka and Meredith being here. It, not always easy to get. These guys are really active. They're touring. So we feel very honored that they're here joining us. So um, thank you for mentioning them because they, they're, we're going to say there's some, two of the leaders in the, in the world that we've been championing. And his work, like his composition work is so different from his performances with Sons of Kemet. Like it's just like fascinating how night and day it kind of is. Along those lines, we've got five, six, seven, eight maybe composers coming and we'll be, um, I'm going to go through some things that I I really like. Uh, Marcus Balter is coming. We're doing a a work of his that he wrote for Contemporary Chamber Ensemble in combination with the rock band Deerhoof. And it's it's the type of thing I think it's all written out. I asked him when I saw the score, when I heard the piece, I said, oh, we've got to do this. I, I'm assuming the drum part, because Greg Sanier, the great drummer in Deerhoof, said, I'm assuming the drum part is improvised. And he said, oh, no, Greg wanted me to write it out because he wanted the challenge. Ah. <laughs> so I, I think we're the only place in the world that actually could recreate this piece, ah. you know, because we've got the, you know, like they say, we've got the musicians, right, <laughs> that, can, that can do this, right? And so we're really, uh, we're really psyched about that piece, and opening that concert is going to be uh, Nick Votinas playing um, a solo cello piece uh, by Marcus Balter that I understand. He did for us. He yeah. did for you. But you want to see it live, listener. Yes, you want, you want to see it live. You want to see it live. That's, those are two spectacular performances and and um, we have this uh, a, a young composer that um, Annika Sokolovsky and I'm you know always really excited when we can bring back a fellow you know someone and Annika came here for the Banglewood as <laughs> as a oh Bangle sorry wood. sorry 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 I sorry love sorry, it. sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. <laughs> Is that what it gets called colloquially around here? No, here's, a, here's the story. No, 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 no. no. Uh, Everybody uh, calls it Bang. Well, here's the story. Um, you know, <laughs> these nicknames come about, bang, bang in a camp, whatever. But Banglewood is the one that stuck. So, you know, and we have a wonderful relationship with Tanglewood. You know, at, at, in the early days, I think the, we the previous leaders were, were like, people. could you not call it Bang? We're like, we're not calling it Banglewood. <laughs> You know, so I, but I think it is really delightful. And as just when you were talking about the Kusvitska, I thought in my head, Banglewood. Uh. Uh, and, and, you know, I think one of the fun things is um, that there have been this amazing uh, championing of new music in these illustrious places like Tanglewood, like Aspen. Um, really incredible. Um, I think that one of the differences is that um, this is all living composers. So, so it's not... Um, component of something larger it is the whole thing is mm-hmm. and I think that's having been at festivals all of us composers attending different kinds of festivals we really wanted it to just be completely about the music of now so anyway that's the tie-in from from, <laughs> well, from, from Tanglewood to Bangalore I'm going to try to pretend I never heard that and never say it out loud again but okay. I think it's too late that ship has yeah. sailed yeah. Yes. Yeah. we so- are speaking with the two founders of Banglewood two of the three uh bang on a can here at Mass Mocha Michael Gordon and Julia Wolf. um in your, like, so the, the fellows come in, they're here for like two and a half-ish, three-ish weeks before the whole Loud Weekend starts. And a lot of that is like, 
um, like small groups and, and instruction. Um, has your perception or advice to these, has your instruction of the fellows that come in significantly changed over the past 23 years it, based on what you've seen? It's a great question because as an organization, can I even call us an institution, um, Bang in a Can is always evolving, always changing, always tweaking, always looking for new needs in the community, new new endeavors. So we never sit still. And that is maybe one of the greatest characteristics of, of what you could say about Bang in a Can. Um, so over the years, it has very much evolved. and But I think some of the important things that inspired the summer festival are still present. One was um, we get in these really high level musicians. They're all classically trained. They're all incredible reading chops, performance chops. Um, but they're all very, very curious and adventurous. That's why they come here and they, they meet each other. Um, we wanted to give them some musical experiences that were not written music. So the first week we have the incredible Ghanaian drummer, um, Nani comes in and, and works with everybody in the mornings and they do a performance by the end. So suddenly your music is in the body, it's not on the page, and it really changes the players. Uh, so we've done a lot of non-notated music, um, sometimes improvisation, sometimes working with gamelan. We have a long history of, um, of all that kind of music making as well as um, Mark Stewart is, is one of the leading people in the Bang in a Can All-Stars. He's also an instrument builder. So they're building instruments and playing those instruments also non-notated. So it's this idea of body energy that Bang in a Can is known for that goes with that kind of virtuosity. So I don't know, that, that's just evolved over time, but we, that's, that's what's remained, a thread that's remained. But I don't know, how would you say it's changed over time, Michael? I think, I think we started 20-something um, years ago, and we, we would come and we were really instructing the fellows, and now they're instructing us. Mm. You know, the, mm. the level, you know, pl um, making music is kind of like sports, right? It's like, oh, you can't, you can't run a four-minute mile, and then, you know, 10 years later, like, people in high school are running four-minute miles, you know, and... And, and it's, they're so talented and they come in here and you know, they, every year it's like a, a, new, a new generation of these in, incredible musicians. And so I think, that, I think one thing that people really pick up and is infectious by the time we get to Loud Weekend is we've been together for three weeks. We've been eating together and playing music together and talking about music and going on hikes and going to the local, you know, to the fish pond here in North Adams. And it's, it's really spirited by the time you get to the, to the end. It's not, you know, well, these people come on and play and then, you know, they, they're going to the next town or, you know, uh, I got to go pick up my, my kid at soccer. It's really a, a, become a, a close, tight-knit, um, spirited group of musicians. Before we run out of time, we started out with this being a love story, that you're both at Yale and you get married uh, at the same year that you graduate from Yale. Who made it weird first with the music? Who, okay. said, who said, like, we're not going to do Beethoven and Tchaikovsky anymore. Well, we're going to do Reich and, and Philip Glass and, and go in this other direction. Well, I think that came first because um, it's all of our... What, one thing that connects Michael, David, and I is the love of this music, this very forward-looking, very visceral, you know, this music that returned back to the very elemental things like uh, rhythmic patterns, groove, pulse, um, modality, you know, these are things that were sort of pushed aside at, you know, very interesting time of modernism, but then all of a sudden, minimalism starts to invade this trance music going on, and we were like, <laughs> yeah, we're right there. We're, we're, that's where we're at. So I think we had that in common, that we were drawn to this music and started to make this music, and then, then the love came. Okay. <laughs> 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 love, marriage, whatever. Uh, yeah. Well, it's been a delight getting to talk to you again. Michael, we talked last year, and to get to meet you, Julia, two of the founders of Bang on a Can, which will celebrate for the 23rd time, or at least... 23 out of 25 years bang on a can here at Mass Mocha with Loud Weekend this weekend. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.
Tomorrow on The Fabulous 413, we'll go on the water with All Out Adventures to see how this organization is making sure that people of all abilities can enjoy the great outdoors. The power of history returns as Clark University professor Usman Power Green tells us about the celebration of Emancipation Day in Northampton. And Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid will tell us about the rock that has signs of, signs of life on Mars. <laughs> I'm Monty Belmonte. I'm Kali Smith. We'll see you tomorrow on The Fabulous 413. We leave you with a little bit of a premiere rehearsal that we eavesdropped on, composed by the British jazz flutist virtuoso, Shabaka.